One of the most important things to know about the sandy shores is that organisms that live there need a lot of adaptations to live in that kind of substrate. The substrate is very easily erodible, and so that means that the sediment can go from one place to another. I think we've all been whipped in the face or gotten whipped on our legs with a bunch of sand. Um, gusts of wind or just a single wave can remove a lot of that sand. So if you're an organism trying to attach to the sand, you cannot. And this is going to make the substrate extremely unstable. It's underlined and bolded because that is something that we're going to need to reference for exam content. Sandy shores are also very porous and they have a lot of permeability. Permeability or allowing them to be permeable means that things can permeate through or they can seep through the sediment. There's larger pore spaces between the sand grains. So despite what we think about sand being very fine, it is very fine to us, but in terms of air or water movement, and those are much smaller molecules, it's not. So these larger pore spaces will allow water and air to flow through them very easily. This will also allow sand to dry out a lot faster, does not hold water very well. At low tide, this is a problem for organisms because they could become completely dry within the sediment, and then that can put them at risk for desiccation. Desiccation is the removal of moisture or the drying out of an organism. So when considering producers at Sandy Shores, producers are gonna be what brings all the organisms to that area because they set the bottom of the trophic level. And so they're gonna be synthesizing organic material and it'll feed your primary consumers, secondary consumers, et cetera. So because the shoreline is very unstable due to having a sandy substrate, and it's also very porous, but mainly it's very unstable, it's easily erodible, there's nowhere for producers to attach their roots. If they did, waves or wind would just knock them away. So there's no place for attachment. That's gonna be the biggest issue. So seaweeds, kelp, seagrasses, they cannot live there. The only producers that can live in this littoral zone, so the area between the highest high tide and the lowest, uh, I'm sorry, the highest spring tide mark and your lower spring tide mark, that's the area we're talking about. I'll bring that up in a second. The only producers that can live in this area are going to be phytoplankton that get washed up from the waves. With that being said, if you're thinking about sand dunes, Sand dunes are not classified in this littoral zone because they're typically never inundated because of tides. If sand dunes are affected by water, it's because there's a storm surge, we have a hurricane, something like that. And the sand dunes are actually built there and they are established there so that they can prevent further shoreline erosion and they protect the, the coastal area and our coastal communities from further flooding. But otherwise, there's really no producers there, which is indicative of why there's such low biodiversity in a sandy shore ecosystem. To deal with the abiotic factors of a sandy shore, mainly that the sand is very porous, so it dries out very easily, and it's very easy for gases to go right through it. Um, it's a very shifting substrate, it's easily erodible, so we really can't have any sort of attachment with seaweeds, sea grasses, or other producers. Um, they need to be what's called in fauna. And in fauna are organisms that need to live inside of the substrate instead of living on the substrate. And so to do that, they must be really good at burrowing. And honestly, though it's not mentioned on the slide, also have a shell so that if they are left out from low tide, then they can also close their shell and maintain moisture so they don't desiccate. So they need to be burrows, uh, burrowers. It keeps them safe from the erosion of waves and from wind. Some examples. Um, there's two different types of annelids. Annelids are worms that are not parasites. They're like, think of it like an earthworm. But there's ragworms and then there's also lug worms. And we've seen a lot of these types of things down here in the right corner on our beaches in Florida. Those are actually like sand casings from the worm digging. So as it goes into sediment, it like eats its way through the sediment. And this is kind of what comes out the other end as it's eating. So it's kind of like if you imagine putting a straw through the sand 
you're going to have a lot of sand coming out the other end of the straw. So now that when you see this on the beach, you'll know what it is. But there are a lot of those. Um, ghost crabs, which we also have on our beach. They're very good at camouflaging, but they're also very good at burrowing. And cockles and scallops. And again, we've noticed on shore that whenever a wave goes back into the into the um, you know offshore, then we can see like a lot of those little cockles reburrowing themselves into the sand to keep them from getting washed away and also keep them hidden. Um, but this one is just a little scallop. It's super cute how they pac man through the water. I love it. Because there's fewer rocks and it's just flat sand, and I shouldn't say flat, it has a gradual slope, there's really less habitats and there's less places to hide and to escape predation. So predation ends up being one of the biotic factors that are prevalent on a sandy shore. And to be a biotic factor, this has to be something that is influenced by other things that are alive. So things that are not biotic would be like the porosity or the porousness, but the porosity of the sand, the erodibility of the sand, and that it's a very unstable substrate. Those types of things are going to be the abiotic factors. But predation, because it is dealing with things that are living and their organisms are preyed upon by other things that are living, it is a biotic factor. Competition is another one. So one of Cambridge's favorite definitions are niches or niches. I always say niches. It doesn't matter. These are a role that an organism can have in an ecosystem. And it's very specific that you say it's an organism's role in its ecosystem, not organism's job, not organism's purpose. It has to be role for sure. So these roles are provided whenever you have many producers in an ecosystem. And as noted on previous slides, the producer population is very low. The only producers that you can have there are going to be phytoplankton that are brought in by the tides or brought in by waves. That's it, mainly because there's no substrate for attachment. So with low producers means there's going to be low organic material synthesized and you're not going to have a lot of food sources. Your first trophic level, your producer trophic level is going to be extremely, extremely low. The other food source that's an option is organic material, mainly just like pieces that get washed in with the tides and the waves. And those are going to have a lot of competition for feeding on from um, all the organisms that are living in, like in the sandy shore. So, you know, you can see in one of the gifts that I provided, you have your crabs here that are just trying to feed through little sand grains. Um, in the bottom right corner, there is a, uh, it looks, looks like a cockle as well, that's using its like muscular foot, essentially it's an, its entire organism, to actually feel around in the, within the substrate, and it also is a way for them to be able to move. But it's literally just like scraps of pieces that are options for food sources here. So aside from just the phytoplankton that unfortunately get washed up there, I'm going to die. And small scraps and pieces of organic material of other organisms, that is pretty much it. So the main competition for these organisms here is going to be competition over food sources. So with consideration of the abiotic factors, meaning the instability of the substrate, that it's easily erodible, it is very porous, so the spaces in between the sand grains are relatively large, even though to us they might not be, allows water to flow through easily and air to flow through, so desiccation is a risk for organisms. Um, the lack of ability for attachment and how erodible that the substrate is, and then if we consider the biotic factors that there is lack of production from predation and there's a lack of food sources due to the lack of producers, this will allow for this shoreline to actually have very low biodiversity, which is why wouldn't we go to the beach in Florida? We really don't see a ton of different types of organisms at all. We might see a lot of the same type of species, but that's because they're adapted to be living in that type of um, very unstable environment.
we compare this to a rocky shore, this has a very low biodiversity. Biodiversity considers the different types of species that are living in, a, in an ecosystem. And within that also considers their genetic diversity. So the different types of genes that those species have. And if they have a variety of different types of genes, that'll definitely help them become more adaptable to their environment. The remaining slides are going to cover just examples, three examples of organism adaptations in the sandy shore. So our first one is the ghost crab. And I also feature the scientific name of it. Notice that it's written in italics and the capital, there's only a capital on the genus part of the species name. Um, it does go genus, which would be the osteopod part. And then Cordomana is the species name. So genus and species is always how you see it. Um, like ours is Homo sapien, which will be capital H, lowercase s for sapien, but it's always italicized when you see it in print. Um, these ghost crabs, we have them actually on the Florida coastline and in the Carolinas, and so the east coast of the United States. They dig deep burrows high up on the shoreline during the day to avoid the heat from the sun. Um, Cause again, sand is very porous, so it's not gonna hold any type of water. Um, and it's gonna be, it's gonna allow for a lot of air to flow through and for water to flow through so they can get pretty hot pretty fast. And digging in the sand is gonna help them at least keep their temperature cooler. They can be at least a meter, a meter deep. So over three feet deep. It's sunset, so when the sun is gone, they will go to the water line to feed on any detritus or small little pieces of organisms that have washed up on the shore. And they have really good camouflage. Obviously, that's why they're called ghost crabs. You don't really see them. And they help avoid predation with that. Species is the lugworm, scientific name, Arenicola marine. And I'm sure I'm saying it like a brilliant American, but it's MLN. Um, again, the genus is capitalized and the species name is lowercase, but it's all italicized, so you can identify it in print. So these are from the phylum Annelida. They are worms. They're not like parasitic worms, though. They're like earthworms. They burrow in the sand. You can tell because they are releasing this it looks like a worm shape little sand casting right next to them. So you may now maybe notice this when you go to the beach. And the one part is their mouth and they're going to like create a hole with their mouth and then it's gonna release the sand out of their anus. And that is what's leaving that big pile of sand. Um, so they do help filter through filter through the sand and they are going to be eating any detritus or small little organic pieces that are in the sand. Um, they make about 30% of the biomass that are on sandy shore and biomass just means like living tissue, living material. Um, biomass can be food sources for organisms. And a way that they can avoid predation is they, if anything's going to be exposed in their body, it's going to be their tail. So they can leave their tail um, maybe sticking out of the sand a little bit, or if there is a piece that's gonna be exposed, that's gonna be their tail. And if a predator eats it, they do have an adaptation where they can still regrow it and survive, and they also can sacrifice themselves. Our final species is the razor clam. Its scientific name is Siliqua patula, again, capital genus, lowercase species name, but it's always italicized. These are larger bivalves, by like bicycle, meaning two, and valve talking about their shell. So any type of marine mollusk that has two shells, we would call it a bivalve. Um, so they are gonna avoid predation by using their muscular foot that you see here in this top one, the top gif. You can see it trying to dig itself into the sand. Um, it's going to start to wedge itself and dig itself a hole into the sand, and then they're going to expand their shell to allow themselves to squeeze in a little bit more. It just creates more of a space and more of a gap for them into the sand. When they close their shell, it just creates 
it makes them a bit more dense and heavier and it forces the sinking motion. They're gonna continue to open it and close it until they're able to get themselves dug in completely in the sand. And what happens at the end, which is really cool, so this bottom, this bottom one, I know the middle picture, the middle image is a little bit grainy, which is a bummer. It's like actually everything I was looking for. But at the bottom, you can see that it just spits out all of the sediment that it just like dug through. And this part actually that's releasing all of that sediment is called a siphon and the siphon is going to be what's going to remain out of the sand and it's going to serve as a method for gas exchange so it would be like us trying to keep our nose or our mouth above the sand so that we are still able to breathe and have gas exchange and so these are the three different species adaptation examples from the syllabus and this is going to conclude it for adaptations for living on the very porous unstable low food source, therefore low biodiversity, Sandy Shore.